Year's Eve 2003. Four families sit down to enjoy dinner, but within an hour or two are experiencing burning of the mouth, dizziness, shortness of breath, and chest pain. The youngest person affected is only one year old. And this is just the beginning of the outbreak. The food in question is ground beef purchased from the local supermarket. One week later, and of course, as more families are falling sick, the results come back from the lab with some peculiar news. The ground beef has toxic levels of nicotine. Now the investigation heats up because how in the world did freshly ground beef from the local grocery store come to contain toxic levels of nicotine? The same addictive substance found in all tobacco products. When it comes to food, you probably don't look at it and say, ah, uh, that's a bioweapon. But honestly, I think that's what makes this so dangerous. In fact, the World Health Organization has a specific term for this, and it's called food terrorism or an act or threat of deliberate contamination of food for human consumption. Basically, this just means using bacteria, viruses, or toxins to deliberately infect civilians through the food supply. In fact, that's exactly what happened to those families on New Year's Eve. Let me explain. So those four families, or it was about 18 people that originally fell ill, they contact the Michigan Health Department. And the investigators that were put on this case, they realized that everyone who has become sick has eaten the same ground beef, right? You want to find like, what's the common food that is making everyone fall sick? A sample of the beef then is set out to a laboratory to test for uh, different microbial pathogens. Because typically if there's a foodborne outbreak, it's because accidentally the food has a very high bacterial count. It has a microorganism in it that makes us humans sick. A week later, the test results come back and there's no microbial problem. And that's very weird. So investigators sent another sample of the beef, but this time to a lab that will check the chemical composition of the food. Of course, in an investigation like this, time is of the essence because people are still getting sick. So at this point, about 92 people have fallen ill and their ages range from that little one-year-old up to someone who is 76 years old. Days later, the results from the lab come back and the beef contains an extraordinarily high amount of nicotine. There's no way the beef should contain this much nicotine, which makes this look like a deliberate crime to contaminate the beef. At this point, both the USDA and FBI join the investigation. They hone in on one supermarket where the beef is actually ground in-house. It's freshly ground right there in the store, which in theory would make it very easy for one bad actor to potentially contaminate the food. With further investigation, law enforcement comes across a former and disgruntled employee from the supermarket whose job it was to grind that beef in-house in the supermarket. This employee admitted to adding a pesticide called Black Leaf 40 to a batch of 200 pounds of ground beef, which is what those families ended up consuming. And the Black Leaf 40, this specific pesticide he chose, had an extremely high level of nicotine. It was 40% nicotine, where the average pesticide is usually only 14% nicotine because Nicotine is just that toxic to us and to other pests and animals. That's why it's used in the pesticide. Within a couple months, this man was charged with that act of bioterrorism and was sentenced to nine years in prison. But I think this story shows just how easy it was for one bad actor to contaminate a large amount of food and make a lot of people sick. Although luckily no one died in this case. Okay, so how often do you eat the food that's been left in the office break room? I mean, say you get a email from one of your work colleagues that says, hey, it's my birthday. I love cookies for everyone in the break room. I don't know about you, but I'm there. If there's free food, I'm the first one there. This story about bioterrorism now has me thinking twice though. It all begins at a Texas medical center where employees got an email inviting them down to the break room to enjoy donuts and muffins. 12 of the workers decided to go enjoy their sweet treat, 
but they ended up with a bad case of dysentery. Now, I only know dysentery from this old computer game called Oregon Trail, which if you're a American that grew up in the 90s, you know what the video game I'm talking about. But for everyone else, dysentery is like a case of the fever, abdominal pain, cramps, diarrhea, bloody stool, just the whole shebang. An investigation was launched and the pastries tested positive for containing the bacterial pathogen Shigella, which, get this, came from the laboratory's own freezer. We gotta do better than that. The email that invited all the employees down to the break room for muffins and donuts, this was sent from the supervisor's office from the supervisor's computer, but while the supervisor was not in the room, not to mention the email was not signed. Now, Shigella is a very likely choice, a very good choice for a bioweapon for several reasons. First, it's a great incapacitating agent. The good news is it's rarely fatal, but it's great at incapacitating people. This is because it has a very, very low infectious dose. You only have to consume about 10 to 100 of these microorganisms and you will get sick. That, and that's a very low amount. And think about it. There was only 12 employees that ate the muffins and donuts, but all 12 ended up getting sick. And that's a 100% attack rate. To this day, we have no idea who, who did this crime or even what their motive was. But I do think it's a great story on just how easy it was for one person to get a hold of a pathogenic strain of bacteria and spread it. What happens when a cult wants to sway a local election? We don't even have to imagine this because this has happened in the great state of Oregon. Enter the town of Dells, where customers of local restaurants are continuing to follow ill after going out to eat. The health department is eventually called in because for two straight weeks, patrons of local restaurants keep contracting salmonella infections. Over this two week period, over 750 people have become ill with 45 other people being sent to the hospital, all for the same bacterial infection. Things got so bad in this town that eventually law enforcement was called in, but no one actually got any answers for over a year. It turns out a local cult run by Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh were sending out members to deliberately contaminate salad bars in the local town. We know members went to at least 10 different local restaurants. The contaminated food and responsible individual was hard to trace because the cult members didn't always go to the same restaurants and they didn't always contaminate the same food on the salad bar. We know they for sure at some point contaminated things like potato salad, pasta salad, and different dressings. And a year later, when the police went into the cult's compound, they were found to have 10 different strains of pathogenic salmonella. So we're pretty certain a year later they did it. And this was all done with the hopes of swaying a local election where the cult wanted to ensure the approval of a building where they could spread and practice their beliefs. They wanted to make everyone else sick to make sure they could go vote and have this building approved. Although it was a very long investigation, in the end, two different cult members were sent to prison for a sentence of four and a half years. Next, I would watch my video on toxic wine, poisonous baby food, and other foodborne outbreaks and how food regulation can prevent these disasters.